You're listening to Code Switch. I'm Lori Lizarraga. It's an unseasonably warm Thursday afternoon in New York. I'm with my co-host B.A. Parker on an impromptu city tour of sorts. Oh, it's cool around here. Yeah, we are thankful for trees. Wow. That is, there's a place I've been reading about that I really want to visit while I'm in the city. From Midtown, it's about as far south toward the East River as you can go. There's a cab ride, a half-mile walk, and a subway involved. As you exit, please be careful of the gap between the platforms. Parker is here to help. Because as it turns out, I don't know which train to get on. Oh no, that's good, that's good. We get off the Brooklyn Bridge. We're on our way to Chinatown. And then we walk 0.4 miles. And then we'll get to Mott Street. And after all it took to get here, the first thing I notice about this neighborhood is the quiet. It feels very, very bubbled in and, and protected from like the bustle that we just came from. It, it's, it's distinctly less overwhelming. There's like a soapy smell that's familiar to me. We're looking for a 1915 apartment building. It's the family home of author Ava Chin. And where it sits is the title of her new book, Mott Street, a Chinese American family story of exclusion and homecoming. What we find is a six story red brick building with Chinese characters down the front. There are storefronts on the first floor with colorful awnings, an American flag hung up on one side and a flag of the Republic of China on the other. We're standing at the intersection of Ma and Pell. And when Chinese people arrived on Mott Street in the 19th century, they discovered a really thriving neighborhood. It was right next to the Five Points area. It was a notorious neighborhood, but it, it was a working class neighborhood, you know, and, and multilingual, multi-ethnic. That's Ava Chin. So when Chinese folks like my family members arrived there, they found a variety of different immigrant groups, and they also found a home there with other Chinese people. She wrote her book here in this same apartment building where both sides of her family, 49 grandparents, great-grandparents, uncles, aunts, and cousins, lived before her. I read something in her author's note about that that stuck with me. That it was in this apartment, in the process of writing her family story, that her ancestors began speaking to her, bursting through walls, begging her to write faster, demanding to be heard. I remember the first time I walked into the building and walked into one of the apartments that my family members had given birth to, the next generation, my my father's generation. And it really felt like, oh, if these walls could talk. And once I counted out how many family members had actually lived in the building, I realized that the building felt like a kind of womb to the entire family. But the story we hear isn't just significant to Ava's family. It chronicles entire chapters of history, ones that shaped the fate of immigrants and the identity of Chinese Americans for generations, really all Americans. So I sat down with Ava to talk more about that. This book is about one immigrant family story, your story, but to tell it, you have to go back generations centuries of time at certain points through pages and pages of historical events. And what we learn is that your family is kind of in all the hits. I mean, from the building of the Transcontinental Railroad and the Tong Wars in the late 1800s to the emergence of San Francisco and New York's Chinatowns, and the, the Chinese-American story was built on the historical events that your family, in many cases, witnessed or was a central part of? I mean, when you started the research for this book, did you realize how deep that thread ran through your family? Uh, no. When I first started doing this research, I really thought that I was just trying to understand my family, right? So I was raised by a single mother. I was estranged from my father and his whole side of the family, right? Mm -hmm. um, the family who raised me only ever spoke about them in whispers. They said they were bigwigs in Chinatown, and I didn't even know what that meant. Mm -hmm. On the same hand, one of the first stories I ever learned about 
was from the grandfather who raised me, who was a descendant of a Chinese railroad worker who worked on Mm -hmm. the nation's first transcontinental railroad. And that was the apparatus that I later learned, um, physically at least, helped unite the country after the Civil War. Right. And in the book, you write about those stories about your great-great-grandfather, Yuan Sun. When Yuan Sun arrived in the 1860s, he and the others still referred to California, and by extension, the entire country, by its gold rush name, Gom San, the Gold Mountain. Although that era had long since passed, The feeling amongst the new arrivals was that through their luck and determination, like Man Man Ban Tong, 10,000 stampeding horses galloping full steam ahead, they were going to strike it rich. Together, Yuan Sun and his countrymen labored in California's high Sierra Nevada, dangling off rugged cliffs in baskets loaded with explosives, blasting tunnels through miles of granite, laying grade even in the deepest winter, sometimes in over 40 feet of snow. The railroad stories in our family played such a, such a, a large part in how we identified ourselves as Chinese Americans mm-hmm. that I really thought I knew everything there was to know about the railroad by the time I hit grade school. And I remember one day I was in class and I opened up the big textbook in American history that was devoted to the completion of the railroad. And I saw the photo, Mm -hmm. the official photograph, and not a single Chinese face was staring back at me in the photo. And I just thought, what is this nonsense, right? What are they saying here? And and I, I think, honestly, that was probably one of the things that made me a writer, was realizing that... There were these stories that were not told and that needed to be told. Very early on in the pages of Mott Street, you write, it is a general rule of thumb among researchers and historians alike that it is the written record that is the gold standard and the family stories that are long untwisted falsehoods, embellishment, and tall tales. You found over and over that the official historical record was riddled with fiction and fabrication and half-truths, and in some cases, outright lies. What were some of the lies that most shocked you? The mail to my grandfather, to our house, Mm. came under a different name. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother said, oh, that's his paper name. And I thought, well, I don't know anybody else. None of my friends have family members whose mail comes under a different name. Is Mm -hmm. grandpa here under a false name? identity. And it took me a while to realize and put together what this all meant, right? I flew out to Seattle, Washington, where Grandpa had first landed in America, and where I was given clearance to review his Chinese Exclusion Act file at the National Archives offices. The deposition contained a photograph of Grandpa at 16 years old, and another man who claimed to be his father, whom no one in my family could identify. I had never seen my grandfather at that age. He was heart-meltingly young and fleeing the Japanese invasion of China, and here he was, stuck in a facility that was essentially a jail. I looked down at the official file before me, an inch thick. It would take me another few years and a move to China before I learned that this elaborate scheme, a part of the larger exclusion apparatus, had turned his real uncle into a paper father, rendering Grandpa a paper son. The Chinese Exclusion Act file was a complete and utter fiction. So we should probably back up a little bit and talk about what the Chinese Exclusion Act is. Please. Okay, so the Chinese Exclusion Act was our country's first major federal immigration restrictions. It was the first time our country's borders shut for the very first time against a particular nationality. And what it did was it effectively halted legal Chinese immigration into the country and blocked our pathway towards citizenship for over 60 years. It started in 1882 and then went on until the 1940s during World War II when the U.S. needed China as an ally against Japan. It also was really important because it set the tone for future immigration restrictions going forward so that by 1924, 
almost all Asians were banned from coming into the country, mm -hmm. and there were restrictions against other nationalities as well. Can you talk about how that affected your family specifically, Ava? So my grandfather on my father's side, I never met. I remember I mentioned that I was raised by a single mother and I was completely estranged from my dad's side of the family. Yeah. Well, I was shocked to learn that my Chin grandfather was seven years old before he met his father for the first time. Really? And that was a direct result of Chinese exclusion. Chinese exclusion made it very difficult for people to come and go. Even if you were a merchant and had papers, you were still never guaranteed if you could come back into the U.S. What happened is that it was very difficult to bring wives over and to bring Chinese women over. So what happened is the fathers lived in the U.S. and went back to China to the villages and so, you know, saw their families there. Maybe mm -hmm. they would stay for a year and then they would have to go. So in the case of my grandfather, he did not meet his father until he was seven years old. And so he was yearning to know his father in the same way that I was. Mm. Um, and so even though it was different in the end, he did get to meet his father. And I didn't meet my father until I was 27. The way in which Chinese exclusion impacted families on the ground really was eye-opening to me and, and allowed me to see the ways in which my father mm. has lived his life yeah. as being a kind of um, an echo or a resonance sure. of the original Chinese exclusion. Does that help you to understand him and your estrangement from him or maybe his ability to do that? Um, I think it really helped me to understand in a way how difficult it was for Chinese men in this country for so many mm. generations. And that maybe, well, I don't want to excuse their behavior, like the behavior of my great-grandfather um, was rather abusive to his wife. You know, my own father has had difficulties with his romantic relationships. Um, mm. I don't want to excuse that kind of behavior. Um, I think that I have a greater understanding that if you grow up within the community of, of seeing yourself in a certain way, and then you go outside of the community and you have to face different, you know, prejudicial viewpoints, maybe sure. you can't get better jobs. You know, for the longest time, Chinese people could not become naturalized. Right. And what that meant is that you were precluded from entering certain professions. You couldn't become a lawyer. You couldn't become a doctor. You couldn't be a judge. You could not be a politician. And so, you know, I have family members who lived here for most of their lives who were never able to naturalize. And, and that has impact on people, you know? What do you do with that understanding? I think that it helps me to be less angry and resentful towards someone like my father. Um, yeah. You know, even my grandfather had a temper. The one who raised me had a temper. But when I think about the things that he had to go through, you know, living life in this country under an alias, um, never feeling like he was 100% on steady ground at any yeah. moment he could have been deported, yeah. um, that's got to really impact how you live, how you treat other people and the people that you love. And it also has impacts on your health, you know. So it, I think it makes me more empathetic towards folks that um, in my family that before this, I maybe had a hard time forgiving them. Coming up, more stories from Mott Street. They lived in our building in 1918 when the flu pandemic was rampant. They had survived cholera and diphtheria and, you know, the, the various flus. Stay with us. Lori, just Lori, code switch. We've been talking to Ava Chin, the author of the new book, Mott Street, a Chinese-American family story of exclusion and homecoming. Throughout the book, Ava traces the stories of horrible acts of violence and discrimination. And there's one that stuck with me about cue-cutting, the significance of which I learned reading this book. 
Ava cites an editorial from 1885 that really sets the tone for the kind of anger and prejudice that was happening against Chinese people in America at that time. That November, the Truckee Republican published a brisk editorial for Q-cutting, hacking off the long braid Chinese men wore, a sure cure for the Chinese pestilence. It suggested a reward system and a kind of display or trophying, as is the case with pelts of wolves, coyotes, and like vermin when they become a pest. Every time I read this article from the safety of my studio, it makes my breath catch. They thought of us as animals. Of all the stories Ava details, it isn't the cruelest or the most violent. But for me, it's the most personal because of the connection I have to my grandma's hair, specifically her braid. When she was a few years older than me, she wanted to cut off her long hair. And my grandpa loved her hair. So it became a tradition that before she cut it short, she put it in a braid for him to keep. And for us, now, 45 years later, to have that piece of her youth forever is one of my greatest prides that the color of my hair matches the color of my mama's hair identically. There was something about reading the violation of that, something that has been so significant for me to have from my grandma that was just cut off and taken without regard. Hurt, hurt so much to read about. Were there, were there stories like that that you found that struck you while writing the book? That is one example of, of many. Um, and so uh, other ones were um, the wife of a merchant who my family did know, um, who got pushed out of her home in Seattle, Washington in the 1880s when she was in her third trimester of pregnancy. Mm. The things that she experienced were so horrific, and it really broke my heart. There, of course, were other stories about our railroad builder who was happily living in Boise, Idaho for another two and a half decades after he helped finish the railroad, did not want to leave. But when the tides turned against us and his neighbors pushed him out, um, and that was really heartbreaking, too. After almost three decades of living in America, Yuan Sun heard an angry knock at his front door. When he opened it, he confronted a mob of his white neighbors yelling, the Chinese must go. Some didn't even bother to mask themselves as they drove him out of the home he had been living in for decades. That was a story that my grandfather did not tell me until I was a little bit older. He parsed out the story because he wanted me to feel the pride that he felt in the railroad, that the family felt about the railroad. And he told me later about being pushed out, um, you know, only when I was a little bit older and, and old enough to, to sort of stomach the tale. He still had great pride in the railroad that he worked on. So, so there's a lot of that in the book. Um, I feel like one of the things I really learned was that you have to hold space in your heart for both the difficult moments as mm -hmm. well as the happy moments or the stories of resilience. And oftentimes I would feel both things at the same time. Yeah. Do you find that? Um, significant to think about how much resilience your family would have to have, your grandpa would have to have to be able to push out what could be very well just anger, just resentment, but was still a lot of, of pride? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think during this period of anti-Asian scapegoating, I have really felt quite a lot of comfort from the fact that my family members survived what happened to them. The other thing too was that um, in that period that I'm writing about where my great grandmothers mm -hmm. land uh, in our building as upstairs, downstairs neighbors from each other. Yeah, yeah. They lived during a period in time in which the plague was rampant in Hong Kong and they survived. They lived in our building in 1918 when the flu pandemic was rampant and, and killed a lot of people. So they had survived cholera and diphtheria and, you know, the, the various flus. Um, and, and, you know, not all of their children did survive, but 
these women were brave and intrepid. And they're the reason why we're here today, you know. A sort of a miracle when you're you're listing it all out like that yeah. to be able to survive it all. Well, I really drew comfort from that in Love the earliest that. days of the pandemic. Mm. I was like, if my great grandmothers can survive all of this, we can survive this pandemic too. Oh my goodness. That's truly comforting to be able to call on that on what you know is a history of resilience within your family and within the women in your family. Um, I'm curious, Christianity is also a very large presence. You share your opinion and your reactions to a lot of things while we're reading. Um, you don't seem to necessarily give us quite as colored of a reaction to this the evangelizing that sort of like happens throughout this book. So I'm, I'm curious, how does the faith play into the story? Yeah, so so I should say one side of my family were um, considered progressive Christians in that period of, of Christian progressionism. I can't even pronounce that, right? <laughs> um, where it was very progressive to be a Christian in that time period, right? They really believed in self-improvements and... One side of my family really saw uh, these vices that Chinese men engaged in, like gambling, like uh, opium smoking. Um, mm -hmm. They really like tried to stay away from that. And in fact, they actively tried to shut down the gambling parlors Which in Which you write about. Yeah, yeah. So there's one side of the family that's that way. The other side of the family were the ones who had their fingers in every single pie of all of the vices and were getting kickbacks, right, <laughs> from all of the, so, so, um, so there were both. And so I felt like I really needed to try to understand both sides of the family. Sure. You know, you can bring up gambling, right? So I am the granddaughter and the daughter of some very heavy gamblers, right, mm. who, who had gambling addictions. And so I myself don't gamble, right? I think it's a gamble enough to be a writer, right, in America, <laughs> right? Trying to make your living as a writer um, without having to gamble away my money. Um, sure. So he's like one side of the family was like really anti-gambling and was like trying to root out that vice in Chinatown. But then you also have this like this bachelor community that's been created because of the Chinese Exclusion Act laws. And they're living here without, you know, they're women folk, they're yeah, no children, yeah. they have nothing else to do on yeah, their downtime. Yeah. So I kind of felt like, well, you know, I, I myself don't gamble, but I can't be so like anti gambly with them. You know, it's a nonfiction book. There's only. Uh, so much I can know about my family members, you know, who long died before I was born. But I wanted to make sure that all sides, all religions, um, and particularly because, you know, one side of my family were practically missionaries, you know, yeah. within the community that I, I just, that I honored and respected that, even though I myself, you know, and other family members would be like, yeah, okay, you know. Do you do you feel like in any way the, the transition to Christianity played a part in the assimilation that was also happening oh, in the sure. family? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So that side of the family were the first families in Chinatown to speak English at home. Uh, so that meant that their, their kids did better in the daytime school that they went to. In fact, actually, the, the missionaries in Chinatown, they offered free language classes as a way to you know, convert and proselytize. Yeah. My family were Christian in China before they got here. And so those family members were really eager to to be here so that they could get a Christian education. And yeah, and in fact, my great-grandfather on his prep school application wrote, like, what do you want your future occupation to be? And he was like, missionary. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, kind of my funny. goodness. <laughs> I think that being Christian in America really helped them enormously in mm. terms of working outside of the community. Whereas I can say that the other family members who did not have that bent um, really stayed within the community. Also, they didn't have the language skills. So it was a sort of a combination yeah, of yeah, different like things, right, that, um, you know, held them back. And it's hard to say, well, was it the English? Was it not 
really going to church or not being a believe, you know, like, and not having those Christian networks. Like, what was it? But um, certainly the Christian Chinese networks definitely helped one side of my family over the other. A part of reading this book that we are made aware of really, really quickly is how we are sort of invited on this journey with you, and you are very much narrating and navigating us through it, sort of giving us these reactions to what's happening decades and decades and decades ago. I mean, you are, like, aware of what's going to happen next because you're the one who is writing and researching this, and yet in real time, you're really articulating what we're sort of feeling with you, and it, it does feel like an invitation to go with you on, on the journey that is your story. I'm so glad that you say that because in the very beginning, I had this idea that this story was all their stories, right? I wanted to write it in a more distanced, you know, omniscient, third person point of view. But as I continued to do the research, I realized that, you know, a lot of newspaper articles that I was reading from the 19th century were really infused with the kind of prejudicial viewpoints of the day that were very common. But as a, as a, you know, uh, a person, a contemporary person living today reading this, um, and knowing that my family members are living not too far away, um, it was really painful and difficult for me. It felt personal. It wasn't something that I was yeah. like writing about some other community. This was right. my community and my family. And so there would be moments where I really did feel like I got you know, socked in the stomach. And I would like have to hobble away from the desk and like, you know, deal with it the next day. And I, I realized that knowing that the National Archives files were filled with so much fiction allowed me to give space to the oral stories and the family stories. And what I realized, what I, one of the things I needed to do was I needed to bring myself into there too as a as a as a way for the reader to understand and make sense of this all. I love 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 that you came to that conclusion. Um we feel punched in the stomach as as the reader. I felt that with you and it isn't my family. I can only imagine how much you felt that because it is personal. It is your family's story. Yeah, yeah. And and you know, it really was incredibly meaningful for me. You know, doing the research on the family members, I, I feel like I'm closer to them. I'm closer yeah. to the grandfather that I never met, to, you know, the great grandparents that I never met, too. I just, you know, I know so much more about the family and I know so much more about this legacy of what it means to be Chinese in America or what it means to be an Asian American. I feel like I've gotten a real gift, but there's also, a way in which now that I'm a mother myself, I still sit with the young person, the child that was me, yearning to understand who these people were. And now I do, but I have an even deeper sense because I understand what was happening in our country at the time yes. in ways that even they didn't understand it. What do you want your daughter to get out of all of these lessons learned and all of these stories I want her to be able to know what her heritage is, what the obstacles were that her ancestors faced here. And I want her to understand like who she is as an American child and then she grows into, you know, an Asian American woman. I want her to have that very solid foundation that I didn't have when I was yes. growing up as a kid. I felt like I was just like kind of you know, making my way through the dark and just going by gut instinct. She has the benefit of this narrative. That was Ava Chin, the author of the new book, Mott Street, a Chinese-American family story of exclusion and homecoming. Thank you so much for talking with us, Ava. This has been such a pleasure. Uh, it was a pleasure to be here with you. And that's our show. Thanks so much for listening. If you're not already, you can subscribe to our podcast on the NPR app or wherever you're listening. You can follow us on Instagram at NPR Code Switch or email is more your thing. Ours is codeswitch at NPR.org. 
A quick shout out to our Code Switch Plus listeners. Thank you for being a subscriber. Subscribing to Code Switch Plus means getting to listen to all of our episodes without any sponsor breaks, and it really helps support our show. So if you love our work, please consider signing up at plus.mpr.org slash codeswitch. This episode was produced by Jess Kung. It was edited by Leah Danella and engineered by James Willits. Our art director is L.A. Johnson. And finally, a big shout out to the rest of the Code Switch Massive, Dahlia Mortada, Courtney Stein, Christina Kala, Kumari Devarajan, Verilyn Williams, Steve Drummond, Gene Demby, and B.A. Parker. And a special thanks to Parker for taking me to Chinatown. I'm Lori Lizarraga. Get wild. Call a cousin. <laughs>